Well, good morning and welcome to Christchurch, Virginia Water. My name is Vincent. I'm a curate here. A little bit later, we're going to be hearing from Simon, our vicar, as he continues our series through the Sermon on the Mount. This week, focused on Jesus-shaped prayer. Whether you're a regular or you're just dropping by, we're delighted that you're here with us. Do say hello on the live chat and plan, if you can, to stay on for Zoom coffee after our service. This morning, Steve and Sarah will be leading us in our sung praise, so let me hand over to Steve to introduce our first song. Morning, church. Uh, we're thinking today about prayer, and primarily we come to um, prayer to God because he invites us to, and uh, not out of a religious duty, but because God is good and longs for intimate friendship with us. Uh, David wrote these words. He said, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly seek, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. In this parched and weary land where there is no water, I have seen you in your sanctuary uh, and gazed upon your power and your glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast, and I will praise you with songs of joy. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You never change. You never fail, oh God. True are your promises. True are your promises. You never change. You never fail, oh God. So we raise up holy hands to praise the holy. Yes, we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. So wide is your love and grace. Wide is your love and grace. You never change. You never fail, O oh God. Wide is your love and grace. Wide is your love and grace. You never change. You never fail, O oh God. So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy. Yes, we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. So you are, you are, you will always be. You are. Yes, we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come.
Thank you, Steve. In our reading today, the Son of God will teach us about prayer to our Father who is in heaven. But if we are to pray to him, we must first know him and believe in him. So let us remind ourselves and one another of that faith which we have. As we stand to confess the God we trust in the words of the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered <laughs> under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For well, the Lord Jesus not only encourages us to pray, but he also warns us against praying in the wrong way, particularly against praying without humility and repentance. You might remember how he tells the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, of the proud Pharisee who looked down at the tax collector as he prayed, as he trusted in his own righteousness. And then the tax collector, who could not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and called out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And it was the tax collector and not the other who went home at peace with God. In the same way, let us come to God our Father, not boasting of what we have done or how we think we are better than others, but mourning our sins, seeking his mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So let us confess our sins together using the words on the screen. To you, all-knowing Lord of all, with grief and shame I humbly call. I see my sins against you, Lord, the sins of thought, of deed and word. They press me sore, to you I flee, O God, be merciful to me. O Lord, my God, to you I pray, O cast me not in wrath away, let your good spirit ne'er depart, but let him draw to you my heart. That truly penitent I be, O oh God, be merciful to me. O oh Jesus, let your precious blood be to my soul a cleansing flood. Turn not, O oh Lord, your guest away, but grant that justified I may go to my house at peace to be. O oh God, be merciful to me. Merciful God, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please do be seated and open up your Bibles as we hear from our merciful God as he speaks to us by his holy word. The first reading is Jeremiah 29, verses 10 to 14. Jeremiah 29, verses 10 to 14. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me 
when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. Prayer. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, children. I've got a really big, super important question for you today. How many times do you think that you need to ask God for something before God hears you and knows what you need? We know that God always wants us to pray, don't we? How many times is enough? What are you thinking? Is it 10 times? A hundred times? Is it even more? Get someone to put the answer in the chat if you like. What are you thinking? Well, if your answer is between one and ten, then I'm afraid you're wrong. And if your answer is between ten and a hundred, or even beyond a hundred, you're wrong too. Because actually, the answer is zero. Nothing. God, our Father in heaven, knows what we need even before we ask him the first time. You see, prayer doesn't work because we've said it a lot of times or we've gone on for ages and ages. Prayer works because God, our Father, loves us and he is so happy to answer his children when we ask him. Remember that when you pray to him today. The younger children are now invited to go to a separate Zoom session now. The link is on the screen and we are going to now sing together in reflection on God's word before Simon opens it for us in the sermon. In deeper reverence, praise 
in deeper reverence ways. In simple trust like theirs who heard beside the Syrian sea the gracious calling of the Lord. Let us like them obey his word. Rise up and follow me, rise up and follow me. O Sabbath rest by Galilee, O calm of hills above, the Jesus shed on mended knee. The silence of eternity Interpreted by love Interpreted by love With that deep hush subduing all Our words and works that tender whisper of your call as noiseless let your blessing fall has fell your manner down has fell your manner down drop your still dues of quietness till all are Driving seas, take from our souls the strain and stress, and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace, the beauty of thy peace. Breathe through the heats of our desire, your coolness and your bow. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire, speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O oh, still small voice of calm, O oh, still small Hello everybody, uh, we're continuing our journey in the Sermon on the Mount and, and we're coming to words that we're really very familiar with. We could recite them uh, off by heart uh, and that is the Lord's Prayer. Let me just uh, pause for a moment and ask God to help us uh, with this challenging passage. Dear Lord, we pray that we might learn new things from this passage that we haven't seen before. But perhaps more importantly, the things that we know so well, we would see how we can put them into practice so that we as a church and as individuals uh, would be a praying people seeking regularly after you. So please, Lord, send your spirit to me as I speak and to each one as we hear that your word may be written on our hearts in Jesus name. Amen. Prayer uh, is essential. Um, it is uh, the sort of lifeblood of the church. Spurgeon was once asked, what's more important, reading the Bible or praying? To which he answered, well, what's more important, breathing in, reading his word, or breathing out? Um, prayer is part of us opening ourselves up to God in daily constant communion. There's no trick. Um, I'm not going to kind of give you 10 steps to a healthier prayer life. Um, hopefully there'll be things here that will be a reminder to you, will help you to remember what it is to pray, encourage you to do it. Uh, but it is also more than just talking about it. And so I've got to preach the sermon to myself. Um, we need to keep relearning. We never sort of crack prayer as if 
right, we've got a technique and a method. We need to keep changing it. We need to keep relearning. Um, C.S. Lewis, the last thing he wrote, I think, it was actually published posthumously, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. He said, relying on God has to begin all over again every day as if nothing had yet been done. And so much of the Christian life is like that. Uh, you know, like I say, as I prayed in my prayer, there may be things that you perhaps not thought of before. I imagine most of it is about how can I just relearn those old truths so that prayer might be central in my life. There are all sorts of challenges that we face on there. Um, there's busyness. You know, uh, what do you do when you open up your phone in the morning? Um, scroll social media, read the news, look at your emails. It's good if you use Lectio um, because that gets you praying straight away. But, you know, all sorts of things can easily squeeze out prayer. You need to find a way to do it in the busyness of life. Not only just as sort of devotional, but also um, as part of your breathing in and out uh, every day. There's also the problem of familiarity and actually Jesus is going to castigate both verbiosity, you know, the, the, the verbosity of words that, you know, the Pharisees made a big show of that, the visibility and the profusion of words. We can be guilty of it in different ways. We may not stand on a street corner in flowing robes and pray, um, but we can be very familiar with this prayer and so much in the way of our liturgy that it kind of trips off our tongue. And it doesn't have to be even liturgical, just even the way that we go about the business of it. How do we make sure we're real with God in our prayers? Jesus makes a few important assumptions uh, in this passage, um, where Matthew 6, 5 uh, to 15. Um, uh, yes, don't be like the hypocrites, but but also in your attitude towards God, you know, you'll go to your father in secret. Um, don't think that you're telling him something he doesn't know. Uh, you... Uh, go before him no need to babble on because in many words your father actually already knows everything you need um, but you come before him humbly grateful to be in his presence and even as the prayer begins our father in heaven our father who art in heaven actually in the greek father comes first father our father you're in heaven we approach him in childlike faith, um, Jesus called him Abba Father. I like the little boy who started the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hello. Um, yeah, good, because we got that degree of confidence of a child going into the presence of his father. Um, there's a communal, communal side to this as well. Yes, we pray on our own and we need a secret prayer life. But it's our Father. Um, we do pray together. Don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying about visibility. You know, that, that actually we long for praying together. We do it via Zoom at the moment. But again, it'll be great when we can do that all together. Our Father in heaven, the one who is on the throne, we can come before the king with the confidence of the king's children. Um, hallowed be your name. May, may your name be held in reverence we'll come back to that in a moment um actually we call this the lord's prayer but jesus taught his disciples to pray and, and the, the parallel in luke chapter 11 makes it clear that jesus was asked how do i pray and this is the form that slightly different in luke that he gave them jesus himself prayed a prayer that encapsulated some of these things but maybe slightly different um in gethsemane on the night before he died uh, again, touch on that again in just a moment. But for most of us, again, C.S. Lewis says in that book, prayer in Gethsemane is the only model. Removing mountains can wait. We're like Jesus saying, please take this cup away from me. Yeah, not what I will, your will be done. Um, prayer is all about the business of God having his rightful place. God on in heaven also being Lord of my life and making sure that it's his affairs that are given all the attention they need to have in this world around us. Again, very familiar, um, but let me just divide it up into sort of two sections and quickly touch on each of them. There are three Godward prayers and then there are three personal petitions. And very interesting, actually, that the first thing that happens 
in Jesus' prayer is that we focus upon God. Um, I went to a lecture this past week by a um, historian friend of mine, and he was talking about the Book of Common Prayer. And uh, we don't use that liturgy very much anymore. We use a modern version of it in our 830 service when that meets. And one of the things that really strikes you about that uh, 16th century liturgy is it was very God focused. It didn't start with human beings, it actually started with God. And that's a good pattern, actually, that we learned from the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name. Not Harold be your name, as I thought it was once said. Hallowed. Hold in reverence and awe. Hold God in the highest esteem. Yes, we can call him ever father. But he's also king and lord and sovereign. And, and I'm glad about that because I'm bringing in some pretty difficult requests lots of the time. Aren't you glad that he's the king? So I come with a degree of respect and awe. Don't amble into his presence. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. It's a big theme, actually, in Mark's gospel, the coming in of the kingdom of God. That finally, the king has come to earth to bring in his kingdom. And of course, all of the conversations with the religious leaders and even with the Romans is, what is this kingdom? Is he going to overthrow the Roman Empire? Is he going to set up a throne on earth? And certainly many of the Jews were hoping that he would take Israel back to be their own all over again. No, Jesus' kingdom comes when, when I bow the knee to Jesus, my Lord. Um, King Jesus rules over me. And I'm saying, let your rule and reign be known in my life and let it overspill into the world around us. So that when people see how I speak and how I act and how I think, there's a higher throne, King Jesus, and he's my Lord. Your will be done. And again, I've mentioned Gethsemane. That's what Jesus even prayed before his father. Um, please take the cup away, but not my will. Your will be done. Um, it's great, right, important to pray for specific things. And actually, Jesus encourages us to make three personal petitions in a minute. But most of our prayers are, Lord, I actually don't really know what to pray your will be done you do what most hallows your name and brings in your kingdom now don't get me wrong we do pray for specifics and, and i'm glad we started this new whatsapp prayer group to pray for each other and there's a prayer button going up on the website for people to ask for prayer and there are all sorts of ways in which we encourage prayer through our daily prayer and lent in other ways and and pray specifically please don't misunderstand me and sometimes god gives you a very definite sort of gift of faith encourages you to ask in a certain way. But it's not unholy to say, Lord, I don't know what the answer to my problem is. Your will be done. Actually, that's a humble thing to say before our God and our King. So notice those three focuses on God first. And, and I want to encourage you to do that when you pray. Settle your heart to focus on the greatness and the hallowing of his name, on his kingdom and on his will above everything else. What about the three personal petitions? Well, give us our daily bread. Um, well, Jesus would say, I am the bread of life. But I don't think he's saying, give me Jesus. I think he's actually saying, give me my staple diet. Give me what I, what I need, my necessities, not my luxuries. Give us my daily rice, if you lived in India. Give me what I need to get through each day. A little bit like the manna principle we've been looking at in Exodus. You know, that every day was sufficient for that today, that day twice on the day before the Sabbath, and it was rotten the following day. Give us give us enough bread for today, Lord. Um, I don't know about you, but I find myself overthinking, you know, particularly as we come out of lockdown, what's the next three months gonna look like? What's the next year gonna look like? What's the next 10 years gonna look like? And it's right to plan, it's good we got a vision to help us do that. But let me start each day. Give me bread for today. Sustain me today with what I need, my necessities. Forgive us our sins. Um, we come to him to confess our sins. Again, as the old prayer book says, our devices and our desires are turned against the Lord. 
And so the general confession in the Book of Common Prayer is very thorough, uh, bringing our sins before God. Now, I was having a chat with somebody actually just this past week saying they're opening up to questions of faith. And they're saying, you know, I was brought up in a form of church where all that seemed to happen is that our sins were sort of regularly rubbed in our faith. Why do we spend so long thinking about how miserable we are? To which I think the answer is, as Tim Keller so eloquently put, is that the gospel says these two things, that you are more sinful than you could ever imagine. You know, that your heart is more wicked when the Holy Spirit pours his light into your heart. Actually, my devices and my desires are warped and twisted. I don't know how to do one good thing. All of my motivations are tainted. I am totally depraved, not utterly depraved, but totally depraved. Every bit of my thinking and my actions are depraved. I need to confess. So you are more sinful than, than actually you really think. But actually, you're also more loved than you could ever imagine. And both of those need to be heard by our lost world. As it were, it's, you know, the right diagnosis of our human condition. I went to the physiotherapist because I thought well, I had a frozen shoulder. And I'm glad I went because actually I had a trapped nerve. A frozen shoulder couldn't be treated, but a trapped nerve can. And I've now had six weeks of physio. Started to feel an awful lot better. And actually every time I go, went yesterday, the pain the following day is quite bad because they've been manipulating it. But then it starts to improve. And confession is a bit like that, you know, that I... I need a right diagnosis of my sinful condition. And then having had the right diagnosis, then I can have the treatment um, and ultimately the cure. Um, that's why we confess our sins, because we are sinful and we need his forgiveness. And, and Jesus reiterates it by going on to verses 14 and 15. But if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other, uh, others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Now, it's not a, a bartering here. He's saying that if you know what forgiveness is, then you're going to be the most forgiving people because you've known lavish grace. Now, I don't know if you saw it. There was um, an article in The Spectator this week um, about the jockey George Eliot. Did you see the story that an old photo came out of um, George Eliot taking a selfie um, sitting on top of a horse that had just died? A horrible thing to do. And actually George Eliot has said that it was a terribly badly judged picture of Spur the Moment and he's deeply sorry for it. And he has apologised and to the relevant authorities but also to all of his fans. But he is consistently being hounded for it again and again and again and again. And the spectator, as far as I know, for no obvious Christian reason, has said, can we forgive this man? You know, why is he still being castigated for something that he did wrong and has confessed and said sorry for? Can you ever move past your faults? You know, and that applies to so many people um, who've done something wrong. Um, and their wrong is brought back up again before them, particularly nowadays of social media. Actually, God's grace is so much greater. It would be a bad thing if our rights outsider thought that all they ever heard was about sin. Because we confess sin so that we can be forgiven and so we can be forgiven people. So that's this great petition, which actually features very highly in this prayer. First was give us our bread. Uh, second was forgive our sins. And the third is lead us not into temptation. Um, now, uh, lead us not into temptation could also mean lead us not into testing. So sometimes that word is translated that way because um, God doesn't tempt us to sin. The devil does. But God uses that temptation in order to test us. And that's just what's been going on in uh, the previous um, chapter in Matthew chapter four, where Jesus was tested. And in this period of Lent, we remember those 40 days of testing in the wilderness. Um, but the prayer is that, that when temptation comes our way, that we shouldn't succumb to it, um, that we shouldn't enter into that which we are being tempted by. Um, in fact, Jesus says this again, um, just in the, um, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, you need to pray that when 
um, the glitter of this world or, or when the attraction of fame or when a little bit of ill-gotten gain could come your way, that you don't fall into that temptation. Deliver us, Lord, um, from falling into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the attacks of the evil one who wants to drag us down and to pull us into sin. Now, actually, in, in this version of the Lord's Prayer, it stops there. Um, we add, for yours is the kingdom, the glory, the power, forever and ever. Amen. Which kind of rounds off elsewhere in the Bible. But this teaching is pretty simple. Um, come before God, our Father. Uh, come together before God. Uh, ask him to be honoured, his kingdom to be recognised, his will to be done. And pray for your necessities, confess your sins, and ask for his help that you won't fall into temptation. Now I'm just going to pray uh, as I close, and Greg will lead us in our intercession straight after this. But before we do that, I'm just going to pray very slowly through the Lord's Prayer. And, and as I leave a little gap in between each sentence, um, why don't you just make that prayer your own and take it into this week? So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Today we come to you, Father God, using the Lord's Prayer as our pattern for prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. Thank you, Lord, that we can call you Father. We are your children and we call to you and rely on you just like our children call and rely upon their own parents and carers. Hallowed be your name. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we long for the return of your son, Jesus Christ. And until he returns, help us to seek and do your will on earth. Convict us of our sinful ways and lead us in your paths for your own name's sake. We especially pray for our political and church leaders that your will be done here on earth as it is done in heaven. Let them have wisdom, knowledge and act with integrity and a humble spirit of serving. Help us to be gracious when we talk about them and continue to lift them up in prayer at all times. Give us today our daily bread. Lord, we live not just by food, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Help us to listen to your word daily and to feed on your word in our hearts by faith. Speak to our hearts and help us to follow you more closely day by day. Lord, help us to remember those who rely upon food banks to give their families a good meal. Help us to be part of the solution. Stir us to give and serve. And forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive them that sin against us. Lord, this is the only part of this prayer that you reiterated. Let us treat it with the importance that you've given it and seek our hearts now to consider if there is anyone we hold a grievance or grudges against. Let us all wait as we ask the Holy Spirit to bring to memory anyone we need to forgive. Lord, we open our hearts and forgive anyone who has wronged us, regardless of our own rights or situation. Let forgiveness and freedom settle on our hearts as we receive your forgiveness for our own shortcomings, sins, oversights and deliberate wrongs. Thank you for your forgiveness. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, we pray for protection from evil for each of us, for health and wellness. Let us just pause and bring to mind anyone who needs God's healing at this time. We ask for your healing and protection for all those who are ill or suffer for your name. Father God, we want to thank you for the progress of the vaccines and their effectiveness. We lift up to you all of the volunteers, NHS staff and others working daily to deliver the jabs to us. Please give them strength to continue and encourage them daily. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. We remember, Lord, that you are able because you are the king, holder of all the power and radiant in glory. There is no one like you. No one comes close. You are kind, forgiving and full of love for us. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Now, some of what our Lord Jesus said to us in today's reading has been challenging. And that is a good thing. But don't let it leave you helpless this Sunday. For he is teaching us to pray as his people because he has made us his people. Through his incarnation, through his death and through his resurrection, we know that we now have nothing to fear from sin or death. And so even as we pray, we do so boasting not in ourselves or anything we've done, but finding a sure and certain hope in Christ alone. Please stand. Oh, 
thank you, Steve and Sarah. What wonderful words of encouragement and hope. A few brief notices. First, our plan for reopening God willing is that you would be able to come and join us in person for the 1030 service starting the 21st of March. Uh, as before, you need to pre-book for contact tracing now, and we will remain live streaming as well. Monday, Thursday and Good Friday will also be live in person in church. And then from Easter Sunday onwards, we're going to be having an 8.30 and a 10.30 a.m. service in person. The 8.30 a bit more traditional, the 10.30 more contemporary. The new format 6.30 service is going to stay on Zoom for the time being, and I very warmly commend that to you. Do come and join us. Secondly, Remember to sign up for the quiz night. There are still slots available, but you need to book your team in to get the Zoom details. And finally, please make sure that the Jeremy Marshall breakfast event is in your diary. Do be encouraged to invite your family and your friends and your colleagues to come and Zoom with us for this. Now, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us this day and always. <laughs>